A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and of course on your smart speaker. Coming up today, hate crime crackdown or war on free speech. Angry, angry crowds descend on Scotland's parliament to protest against the SNP's new hate crime and public order act. Details on the way. Team GB's gone woke. Fans are left furious after Britain's Olympic team give the Union Jack a diverse new rebrand. We'll look at that. And a new TikTok scam sees Albanian gangsters targeting pregnant women to help bypass the UK's asylum system. And of course, it's your call. This show is all about your responses and your opinions. We're asking this question. Is free speech in the UK under threat? Our lines are open now. 0344 499 1000. You can text 8722. Or of course, on the socials, it's at Talk TV. All of that's on the way, but first, Let's get the latest news headlines from Dibby. Good afternoon. Israel's Prime Minister says one of its strikes in Gaza that killed seven aid workers, including one British national, was unintentional. In a video message, Benjamin Netanyahu said this happens in war and his government will ensure it doesn't happen again. Officials in Cyprus say some ships are turning back from Gaza, carrying around 240 tonnes of undelivered aid due to the strike. Rishi Sunak says his thoughts are with the friends and families of the victims and Israel must investigate the tragedy. Some breaking news. At least 27 people have died and several are injured after a fire at a nightclub in Istanbul. The blaze broke out during renovation work at the venue. The victims were thought to be involved in that refurbishment work. Eight people have been injured. A 12-year-old has died and two others injured after another child opened fire in a school in Finland. The suspect, a minor, has been arrested in connection with the incident at a primary school north of Helsinki. The area has been cordoned off as investigations take place. Rishi Sunak has backed J.K. Rowling over the author's comments about new hate crime laws in Scotland. The legislation protects transgender people, but Rowling, who does not believe people can change their gender, said freedom of speech and belief are at an end in Scotland if the accurate description of biological sex is deemed criminal. And she even urged authorities to arrest her. The Prime Minister was asked today if police should take action. Not right for me to comment on police matters, individual matters, but what I do support very strongly of people's right to free speech, and nobody should be criminalised for saying common sense things about biological sex. The Labour Party claims conservative turmoil under Rishi Sunak has cost the taxpayer £8.2 billion and nearly a year in lost time. Labour's unveiled a website called The Cost of Chaos, which includes a bill calculating the cost of Tory by-elections, ministerial reshuffles and policy U-turns, like scrapping the northern leg of HS2. The number of patients waiting more than a month to see their doctor has risen by 30% to 17.6 million. The British Social Attitude Survey also found less than a quarter of people were satisfied with GP services, the lowest level recorded since 1983. GPs have come under growing strain after the COVID pandemic and ongoing NHS strike action. Dr Lawrence Gurlis from Same Day Doctor told Talk TV the system isn't working. As you say, waiting a month to get in to see a GP. Look, it's Tuesday today. I've been working all weekend. My local GP practice, who I tried to contact on Thursday, has been closed all weekend. That's their contract. That They're not contracted to be open bank holidays and weekends. So where do people go? A new poll has revealed 82% of teachers believe a new school inspection system is needed. Of the 4,500 people surveyed, the overwhelming majority said the current single word judgments aren't a fair reflection of performance. Ofsted's review system has been under greater scrutiny after head teacher Ruth Perry took her own life when her school was downgraded from the highest to the lowest rating. That's the latest weather time now with Isabel Lang.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. There will be some sunshine today, but top and tail of the country, there'll be some rain. We've got cold, uh, cold weather across eastern Scotland with outbreaks of rain this afternoon in the south. We've got this next veil of cloud heading in to bring some really soggy weather to end the day across much of southern England and south Wales. And you can see that also approaching uh, quite quickly this afternoon with freshening winds. In between, yes, some milder, sunnier spells, but there will be a few showers dotted about. Highest temperatures in the south and east at 13 to 6. 17 degrees, just about possible. Now, as we head through this evening and tonight, it stays wet and cold in the northeast, a bit of snow for Grampian. Across the south, we've got that wet weather continuing to push its way northwards across more central areas. It'll be heavy and persistent and get some tricky driving conditions as well. A lot of mist and murk over the hills as well, not particularly pleasant. It does turn a bit drier by the end of the night and quite mild for most, just a bit of frost in the far north of Scotland. And then for Wednesday, well, it's a pretty messy picture. Low pressure creeping into the Irish Sea, throwing that rain right across more central parts of the country, heavy and thundery across some parts of northern England through the afternoon. In the south, at least some brighter spells where it will feel warmest. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon. Now, free speech, the cornerstone of any democracy, is once again being held hostage, this time by the Scottish Government. Scotland's new hate crime laws have created an offence of stirring up hatred and prejudice against somebody because of a specific characteristic. It could be age, gender or sexuality. The SNP First Minister, Humza Youssef, has said the legislation would tackle a worrying rise in hatred. Around the Hate Crime Act, I think every single person recognises that there's been an increase in hatred, not just uh, in the UK, but right across many parts of the world. And that's why a piece of legislation that protects people and some of our most marginalised groups, while at the same time protecting those fundamental values like freedom of expression, I think that legislation is something we should all be proud of. Well, another of the First Minister's loyal lieutenants went even further. The Victims Minister, Siobhan Brown, warned someone could be arrested for misgendering someone. Look, I'm sorry, but let's cut to the chase here. A transgender woman is biologically born a man. Now, if I were to say that outside Holyrood, I could be carted off in handcuffs in the back of a police van. Someone who I know isn't afraid to call out this terrible legislation for what it is is J.K. Rowling. The Harry Potter author took to social media to post a series of tweets describing several transgender women as men. They include the double rapist Isla Bryson. She, of course, was the transgender woman who was sent to a male prison. It was the catalyst that led to the downfall of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, the person originally responsible for this legislation. J.K. Rowling's comments came just days after an SNP member admitted that the author could be subject to multiple complaints from trans campaigners when the new law came into force yesterday. One person who's backing Rowling is Rishi Sunak. Yeah, we should not be criminalising people saying common sense things about biological sex. Clearly that isn't right. We have a proud tradition of free speech and I think it just shows whether it's the SNP or the Labour, these are the wrong set of priorities for the country. Well, I think Scotland's First Minister should listen to the Prime Minister, or maybe he should have taken one look outside his Holyrood office yesterday. He would have seen hundreds of people protesting against this archaic and draconian legislation. It's high time that Mr Youssef realised free speech is a fundamental right, not a privilege, and it shouldn't be messed with. On top of that, you can't create laws that criminalise people for stating basic facts. Today's question, we're asking this. Is free speech in the UK under threat? I want your views on this and all the areas that surround this murky area of our current state of politics. 0344 499 1000. That's where you'll find us. You can text 8722 or on the socials. It's at Talk TV. Joining me now, Deputy Editor at Conservative Home, Henry Hill, is with us. Good to see you again, Henry. I mean, if, it's only when you listen to the wording. Um, Hamza Youssef talking about this increase in hatred. I mean, it, it is... I always resist using the Orwellian kind of comparison, but sometimes you are taken there and you think mm. the increase in hatred, which really is another way of saying an increase in social media, because that's really 
what we're mostly talking about here, you know, half wits that post horrible stuff on social media. I've had it said against me, it's never going to stop, whether it's about somebody's gender, whether it's just about their views on politics. If they happen to be a Tory, they should, you know, be riddled with cancer and their house should be set fire to... I mean, goodness me, the list goes on. We can't legislate, can we, against people causing offence? Well, I think that's one of two problems with this. The first is, as you say, it's absurd. If you think about hatred, actual hatred in this yes. country, pre real prejudice, racism, homophobia, is that is that rising? Is that higher now than it was 20, 30 years ago? No, absolutely not. And I think this kind of narrative really undermines the progress yeah. that we've made as a country. The other one is that uh, it's taking things that are really, at best, a matter of courtesy. Um, I will refer to a trans person by their, by their preferred pronoun, um, but that is... The, the issues at stake in the transgender debate are not sort of as simple as race or homophobia, right? right. Like someone is, objectively speaking, gay or of a racial mm. minority, but the tr trans hinges on a real like metaphysical debate about what gender is and what its relation with biological sex is. Yeah, so you yeah, can yeah, you yeah. can disagree on that. Yeah. And so lumping that in with racism and homophobia is yeah. absurd. Absolutely. And also I think the, the argument I've always tried to put forward, and I've had lots of rows about this, I've had lots of people from the trans community completely agree with me on this, is there's the I mean, I mean the trans debate. I I've done phone in radio shows, Henry, for 20 years, and I, without a shadow of a doubt, up until about half an hour ago, we never once in all that time discussed trans issues. It wasn't an issue. Even when Nadia won Big Brother back in the day, a trans woman, when India Willoughby was reading, that nobody made any Faye Presto, who's a well-known magician on the kind of celebrity circuit. All of it, it never came up, never came up as an issue. And I think what the issue is for many people what, I know J.K. Rowling has some very, along with many others, has some very specific and totally understandable, much of which I, I totally agree with, by the way, concerns about women's spaces, etc. But actually, I think what gets a lot of people in this isn't actually the trans debate, it's the gender debate, where somebody just decides they're going to invent a gender, where a man who happens to be a cross-dresser, not a trans woman, just a cross-dresser, someone who has a fetish, which does exist, people who want to play the system, like a double rapist who suddenly decides halfway through a trial, I'm a woman. Uh, it's that, I think, that's got people. That has done no justice to the trans debate, if there ever needed to be one, but it's that whole kind of gender spectrum thing that I think is a bigger issue. I agree. I think it really reflects two important changes that have happened. The first is simply that this got latched onto by the campaigning sort of network after they had basically won on yeah. gay rights, right? Stonewall, for example. Yep. It reached the point where there was it secured gay marriage. There was nothing and, more and, to and, do and, they, and, and they had this sort of slightly full-on press release of like, well, we'll just have to monitor things. And they were like, no. Trans issues. We've got a new And that's one. what they're doing. Yeah. And the other one is the evolution of, of, of and a split even in, in trans theory, if you want to call it that. Because going back to 10 years ago, especially in the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s, you had, uh, it's now called transmedicalism. Uh, it's people who called themselves transsexuals. And that's people who think gender dysphoria is a real condition, but you have to have it. Um, and then that involves, you know, you should try and pass, get surgery and so on. And then you have the modern one, which is trans transgender, which is basically where you can pick whatever gender you want effectively. Yeah. And the problem with that one is that you basically turn woman, mm. which is a legal category for a reason, because it's reflected on real yeah. issues that affect women, into a category without sort of formal content. Because if, if you can opt into that category as a male body yeah, person, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, for example, Isla Bryson, then, then why do you have it, right? If it's not based Correct. on anything, what's the point of it? Uh, and uh, on, on that, I mean, JK Rowling is absolutely spot on on that point. I mean, and, and also, it's not as if the, the, the story, you know, the backstory of women uh, is, is not without all manner of issues and struggles over the years. Uh, you know, hard-fought rights, etc., that were afforded to men but not women, etc. The vulnerability of women in certain situations that men don't experience, etc. Mm. I mean, you can't just say, but if you want to become one, just join this group and call yourself one. Well, it's a tautology, isn't it? Like, what is Correct. a woman, whoever calls themselves a woman? OK, well, then yeah. in which case, there's no... As I said, there's nothing justifying having a special special Correct. category for women. And I think it's also really unhelpful. There are mo overwhelming majority of trans people were fine 10 years ago. There were important work to do. But you, you get taken over by activists who want to push it as far as it can go, yep. and they make it about putting a male, rape, a male bodied rapist in a woman's prison. Correct. That's not a fight most trans people want to have. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, let's move on to this story, Henry. Labour attacking the Tories their spending with the launch of a Cost of Chaos website. I mean, this is interesting because that would normally be the territory that was round the other way. It's, you know, it's Labour that waste all the money. 
when they're in office, they squander it on, they love a quango, they get their mates in, they, they, they spend it on all sorts of diversity initiatives. They're bonkers, that lefty lot. Mm. That's normally the accusation. Um, they've kind of turned it around here, quite clever in many respects, saying, take a look at what your government's been doing for 14 years and the cost of it. Yeah, uh, they have, as you say, stolen the Conservatives' clothes. This is, seems to be part of Labour's, like, project reassurance. That's the same it. reason that Rachel Reeves is sticking to Jeremy Hunt's spending plans. Yep. Basically, uh, they're worried that they could drop the vase, right? They're ahead, they want to stay ahead, they want to reassure voters who switch from the Conservatives that Labour aren't going to go absolutely mad in office. I think yep. the slightly tragic thing about this is that it's all such small stuff. You know, the, the, real, the real problems facing this country, we just heard on the last segment, reservoirs, railways, housing, like, really big issues. Yeah, yeah. And they're leading on private jets. Like, it's just a trivial sum of money. Whether you agree with it or not, it's a trivial sum of money in the grand scheme yeah. of things. Indeed. There's another story, though. That's, I mean, it's not all uh, plain sailing for Labour, of course, because mm. they've got a whole... Certainly around a lot of their councillors. Um, and what's happening with Israel and Gaza and the war there. There's 20 Lancashire councillors have resigned their Labour memberships uh, over the party's uh, leadership. Uh, this is largely reflecting their views on issues surrounding the Israel-Gaza conflict. I mean, there, there are, and there's been many before them as well. I mean, if you think about George Galloway and what he did, I don't know how many other seats George Galloway can do that in, probably very few. Um, but it could create... It, it, I don't think... It's not a reform Conservative-type battle, no. but it is a, it's something that Starmer's got to keep his eye on. It is a problem for Starmer. Um, Galloway has, to date, never managed to do it in any other seat with any other candidate, right? It's always him and his unique ability. Yeah. Now, there are some Labour seats that are sort of Muslim majority or have a very strong Muslim minority where, plausibly, if they manage to unite that vote, that could be a problem. But it's not that many in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. I think the deeper problem is, is what it shows about how, over the last 20, 30 years, Labour has run campaigning with minority communities. Because you also had that complaint uh, last week about uh, Labour using the Union Jack on everything. Yes. And uh, you had an anonymous Labour source saying, you know, I know some people like it, but why can't we have segmented marketing? And it's like, if you've got to the point where you don't want to put the national flag on your leaflet yeah. because it doesn't work with your voters, that's a really deep problem that your party is part problem. of and has Correct. to solve. Yeah. I, I do wonder whether... I mean, Starmer's probably home and dry. Yeah. And, of course, what's happening at the moment is that Sunak is doing his level best to to try and limit that damage. Um, and I, that, that seems to be his, his MO at the moment. But when you read figures such as 800 migrants crossing the channel over the Easter weekend, and I'm not laughing because I think it's funny in the conventional sense, it's just that the nut... Almost, it's an episode of Roadrunner, isn't it? It doesn't matter what you throw at the situation. It just carries on and gets worse. We've had Rwanda, we had the Ascension Islands, we've had promises of removing benefits and all manner of other things, documenting people back in... Front. The list goes on. Nothing changes the determined who are hell-bent on coming to the UK. No, and I think the really depressing thing, because you're right, I think Labour are currently... It'd be very hard to see... Not impossible, but yep. very hard to see how they could lose the election. But Labour don't have any answers on this, right? Like, the best Labour have said about asylum is they're going to clear the backlog, but they're going to do that without spending any money, yep. and they're going to do it quickly. And the only way you do that is by waving people through. So it, it is entirely right that voters hold the Conservatives' feet to the fire on channel crossings, but yep. bear in mind, Labour have not provided a viable alternative. And it's interesting, because it's only when you think of the figure of 800, and you're trying to imagine 800 deaths, it's a lot of people... Mm. Just in one weekend. Yeah. And so this, we're now at record levels this year. Yeah, absolutely. And this is going to get worse because instability in, in that part, in parts of the world like that are, is yep. getting worse. The French are really worried if the Algerian government sort of falls over. That's a yeah, whole yeah. vast extra stretch of Mediterranean coast that could open up to channel crossings. Like, this is a problem that British governments really need to get ahead of Indeed. because it's not going to get any easier. Absolutely. Henry, thank you. Good to see you. Henry Hill with us here on Talk TV. Now, coming up after the break, the GB Olympics team have given the Union Jack a woke rebrand, leaving some fans... Fans furious. We'll look at that story. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. 
And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And good afternoon, welcome back. I'm Ian Collins. Here we talk on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. We're asking that question, reference uh, free speech. Is free speech under threat in the UK? Uh, a lot of comments coming in on this. Adrian says it should never be under threat. Freedom of speech is what makes a community. It's, an, in a bigger picture, it's what makes a country run rather than have to dial down a person's right to speak their mind. Uh, John says you can't threaten what's already gone. Uh, which is a bleak but arguably uh, understandable response. Margaret says, under threat, it's been destroyed. There is that real feeling in this country that free speech is kind of, you know, bearing in mind the sort of strange world we live in. I, I think most of this stuff is driven by social media, frankly. Um, I, I think in the real world, most people are pretty reasonable, aren't they? I mean, there's one or two halfwits that, you know, would, would squeal and grab their, clutch their pearls if you said anything about the colour of the windows. Um, but generally speaking, I think most people rub along rather well. Uh, Greg says it's been under threat for many years, a gradual chipping away so you notice nothing until it's gone, the, uh, the boiling frog scenario. And Nancy says, when the police started knocking on doors for arguments that people had on the internet, you know it's gone, which is a factual point. It's happened lots and lots of times. We'll come back to that. We want your comments as well. Is free speech under threat in this country? And your wider views on what's happening with the hate laws in Scotland. I mean, you really can't make it up, but it's now a real thing. Our lines are open 0344 499 1000. Let's move to this story. Ahead of this year's Paris Olympics, Team GB have swapped the blue and white stripes of the Union Jack flag for a pink and purple number, sparking outrage among fans who've slammed the rebrand as woke and dumb. Meanwhile, Adidas's controversial kit, football kit, also made headlines. The brand has been forced to ban the sale of their new German football shirts, customised with the number 44, because, it's because of its perceived resemblance to the Nazi SS emblem. I didn't notice that when I saw it. It never crossed my mind, that bit. 
Uh, but the union flag, that's a whole different ball game. Joining me now is news reporter uh, Joe Hayden, for, who wrote the piece, for, Joe Hadden even, who wrote the article uh, on this rebrand for The Sun. Good to see you, Joe. Good afternoon, um, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because not one rebranded story, just as mm -hmm. we've done with one, another one comes along. That's right. Yeah. Presumably, they didn't just uh, design this in the last few days. They must have been working on this forever. That's right. I mean, speaking specifically about the, the Team GB colours, I mean, I think it has been a few months in the making, but especially after, obviously, what we've seen with the England national team as well. Yeah. And then it just seems like a continuation of more of the same. And I think you hit the nail on the head with in your opening segment when you were talking about, obviously, it's only a small amount of people that really are clutching pearls about this kind of stuff, yeah. right? So it begs the question, why are people like Nike and, and, and the British Olympic Association, why are they doing these kind of things? Why are they trying to pander to such a small amount of people? When... Yeah, who is it aimed at? When I, I looked at that, um, the, the Olympic emblem, as or mm. flag, whatever you want to call it, I was, I was trying to work out what the brief was, because I'm guessing that somebody paid somebody an awful lot of money to come up with a new design. There it is there. Uh, does that, do you know, Joe, does that mean anything? Is it looks like there's a bit of a Big Brother logo in the bottom right-hand <laughs> corner. Um, other than that, I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm not going to try and speculate. I mean, the one thing that people have noticed and rightly pointed out is that it does bear a big resemblance to, obviously, the, the change to the St George's Cross yes. that, that Nike made as well. You've got that sort of dashing of, of purple in there and, and slight changes. And, and whether it means something or not, I mean, one thing that does mean something to people is the Union Jack and the St George's Cross. Yep. So why, why do you feel the, the need to change it? I, I think that's the question that a lot of people are asking. It's interesting, isn't it? I was wondering, do other countries, like, go down this route? I mean, is this... I can't... For some reason, I can't imagine somebody messing around with the French flag in that kind of way. I mean, there would be... You know, they'd be burning things on the streets of France. They don't. It doesn't Absolutely. take much in France to create a protest. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. they get the hump very easily over this kind of thing. <laughs> um, I don't imagine somebody would do that. I, I can't, couldn't imagine it in a million years. I mean, in any other country, I don't think that people would stand for this. I mean, even the Americans. I, yeah. I, I can't imagine if if Nike had tried to do something had yeah, purple yeah, yeah. stripes or purple stars on on the American flag. I can't imagine that would be received very well. So I think Brits need to ask themselves why why is it deemed acceptable to do this yep. in the UK and with our beloved flags. I mean, what's interesting, I'm assuming that, although we couldn't work it out here, um, the, the, the different designs within the Union flag, as I mm. think it's officially called, isn't it? It's the Union Jack when it's on a boat, yeah. isn't it? Or something mm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, this, I'm assuming that all those... Can we have a look at that flag again? I'm assuming those different elements of it are meant to mean something or represent something. But what's curious, specifically to our flag, is that... Our flag already means something because it's the Definitely, collective yeah. flags of all the nations. Mm -hmm, that's right. So it's already got a story to it. Exactly. And it's got so and, and, and you're right. I mean, there's such a powerful meaning and, and symbolism behind the, the Union Jack or the Union yeah, yeah. flag, as you, you rightly pointed out. So so why do we need to, to play around with it and change it? And I think, I mean, if you read the story that, that we at the Sun reported, I, I think we, we pointed out that the, the, the design company that was selected to, to rebrand this flag, um, I, I think they said something to the effect of, you know, they want to make it more inclusive. And and as you said, with, with the union flag, I mean, it's inclusive enough. It's already it inclusive. Is, exactly. I mean, it's a yeah. bonkers thing to, to re... I mean, you might as well just redesign your flag. I mean, what's the point of a flag? Exactly. I mean, the flag represents, particularly at Olympic level, you know, mm -hmm. everybody goes, they do the big opening ceremony that costs a, squilli a squillion quid, and everybody marches around and they have some dramatics and some, you know, Cirque du Soleil, do some bouncing off the ceiling or whatever they do. And, you know, the athletes come on at the end carrying their flag. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the flag of the nation. It's not meant to be any other statement than that. Absolutely, You're not meant yeah. to say, well, it's the flag of our nation. Plus, we'd also like to make a few other statements along the way, please. I mean, <laughs> exactly. that's just weird. That's right. And, and, and you think about what the Olympics is. I mean, yeah. the Olympics is, I mean, look, if, if people want to celebrate all these different sort of agendas, these woke LGBT, whatever it may be, then by all means, do so. But the Olympics is about celebrating Britishness, yeah. right? The Olympics, it's Team GB, you know? So that's what we're trying to celebrate with the Olympics. So, so when you when you play around with the flag in this way, you're you're sort of detracting from the main message of what the Olympics is supposed to be. These athletes are going to go out and they're going to represent Team GB in Great Britain. That's what they've been selected to do, yeah. right? They've not been selected to do anything else and push any other kind of agenda. So, well, I, and that's the strange thing, you know. When I, I've never previously, I don't imagine 
you know, a few years back when Ellie Simmons went out representing our country with the union flag on her, uh, her tracksuit top before mm -hmm. she jumped in the pool. Mm -hmm. I don't imagine anybody looked at that and thought, that Ellie Simmons, nice, great swimmer. I wonder if mm -hmm. she's a mad racist. Because <laughs> that flag's a bit iffy. Nobody thought that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's you're, incredible. Yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, um, and, and I, just, I think it just drives home the point that there's absolutely no need to do this, really. And, I mean, a, a, a story we've just broken earlier today is where, where you know, Team GB have, have tried to clarify that, you know, athletes are not, are not actually going to be wearing this. This is more for just the branding and the merchandise that's sold alongside it, right? Yeah. But in a way, I feel like it's kind of too little too late because they've already made their intentions yeah. clear. You normally make... I mean, you can make a, an accompanying logo. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, of course, if, if, You of know, France are hosting it, so they would have done all of that. Mm -hmm. We remember 2012 Olympics, you know, when everything was branded in that, those colours that's and it was right. a great moment, yeah, wasn't it? Everywhere course, you yeah. went, particularly down in London where, you know, you couldn't walk anywhere without seeing a, 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 a Olympic mm -hmm. um, stuff. And that's it was right. a great feeling. So you can incorporate logos and stuff, but you don't have to mess with the flag, for God's sake. Exactly, exactly. There's plenty of other times and opportunities to do this. And I, I just, I don't feel, and I'm sure many of your viewers and many of our readers don't feel either that the Olympics is really the time to do that. Yeah. How many golds are we going to win, Joe? There's the question. I don't, it's not, it's not for me to say. I wouldn't want to speculate, but I'm sure, I'm sure the, the, the great loads. British athletes will do a, a fantastic, uh, loads. If, loads. If, we, if we don't do so well, we'll just blame the logo. Absolutely. We, oh, well, there you go. There exactly. you go. So it was the logo got, what did it. It put now. us off. Uh, good to see you, Joe. Thank, Thank you. you. Joe so Haddon much. from The Sun with us here on Talk TV. Let's move on to another story with uh, interesting connections to the worlds of free speech. The Met Police have faced a backlash after an officer was filmed telling a Jewish woman that the use of swastikas needed to be taken in context. This was at a pro-Palestinian rally. Have a look. In what context is a swastika not anti-Semitic and destructive of the border? That was my question. I don't have an in-depth knowledge of science and symbols. I know the swastika was used by the Nazi party during uh, their inception and the period of them being in power in Germany in the 1930s. I am aware of that. I just can't believe this conversation is actually happening. Uh, what, what, what exactly are you confused about? What, what I'm confused is how you don't, in what context, the swastika is not anti-Semitic. This is what I want to know. Because, again... Well, I suppose, to some, I don't know uh, how... Everybody would feel about that song. I, I mean, it is breathtaking. The footage has been widely circulated on social media, with many blasting the Met for losing control of the streets. The force has insisted the video, <coughs> excuse me, was part of a wider 10-minute interaction, but is still refusing to share the full footage. With me now is the editor of Jewish News, Richard Freer. Uh, afternoon to you, Richard. Um, if a week ago somebody had told either of us that we'd be discussing an interaction of this nature, we'd have thought they'd gone stark raving mad, even taking into context some of the weird things that people have been getting away with lately. We would have all thought, no, not that, surely the swastika. No one's going to... No one is going to construct an argument that there might be an understandable context for a swastika, but apparently not. This is where we are. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me on. Well, yeah, I've just watched it again for about the fifth time uh, in the last 24 hours. And on face value, yes, it does look like a very alarming exchange between a very distressed woman and an obtuse policeman hiding behind the small print in the Public Order Act. Uh, I mean, you don't have to be Jewish, do you, to understand... Um, how upsetting the presence of a swastika is on our streets. Britain stood alone against the Nazis in the darkest days of the Second World War. 60,000 British troops were killed by the Nazis in that conflict. No one in this country should require a lesson about the unparalleled evil symbolism of a swastika. Yet here we are, the, the Met Police, making excuses for it on our streets. Uh, so that is a fair headline reading of this story, but, and there is a but here, I do have sympathy for police at these rallies. I've attended a few myself, I have just to get a sense of them. There are huge numbers of people. They turn up to this thing, they're fired up, they're passionate, they're constantly on the move. Police are stationed, as that gentleman was, in very specific areas. Often they're outnumbered 50 to 1, 100 to 1. They, it's important to remember they are there primarily to keep the peace. 
Um, and on Saturday, there was a counter demonstration as well, which made it even more intense. They're not set up to challenge and to com confront people. They often do it after the event. So I do have some sympathy for the police. Would it not? I, I, I totally agree with you. And we, we've talked about these issues from a, um, a police perspective. And as you rightly say, this is about the, the, the police want to keep the peace. And one wrong move from the, the, the police could mean a, an inflammatory situation. And that's unfortunate that they sometimes have to take a step back and then we'll try and investigate something later because they hope they've got the video footage to back it up. So you're right, I do get that. But I suppose what's irked and absolutely angered a lot of people is what wasn't needed really was the revisionism of what a, a, a swastika might well mean to some people and that there could be a context. And it might have been better for the copper to just go, do you know what, that sounds terrible. I promise you we will look into this. I can't specifically act now, rather than the sort of rather curious rant that this guy went on. Look, I mean, he, he's not the Home Secretary. He's a Bobby on the beat. True. So it's very difficult for him uh, to convey that. As I said, in a very intense situation, of course, waving a swastika or chanting jihad on the streets of London, it's reprehensible. Um, in the case of the word jihad, it's a, a direct insight to, to violence, and that needs to be tackled with the full force of the law. The, 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 the trouble is, um, occasionally our, our free society um, and our freedom of speech laws can be shown up as a bit of a toothless ass. Um, but there's good reason for that. You know, our laws fall on the right side of freedom of speech. Mm. Uh, we're, we're a secular democracy. Um, maybe Scotland is, uh, based on your conversation earlier, perhaps is moving in a different direction. But we are a secular democracy. We're not a police state where threats to the public, both genuine uh, yeah. and perceived by the state, are cracked down on. Um, and there, they would be healthily uh, dealt with. So ultimately, it's a change in the law uh, and how police execute it. Currently, police have got their hands tied uh, they do their investigation after the event because they're there to keep the peace. Yeah. Um, we've seen in the past very, very a small handful of policemen engage with a large group of very um, emotional protesters, and they get set upon. Police get injured. You know, the the the, the uh, Mark Rowley has got uh, a duty to the care of of his police on the streets. Um, I think perhaps as much as, um, you know, the safety of the marches. So all that needs to be taken into consideration. Got it. Listen, Richard, thank you for your time. Richard Ferrer, who's the editor of Jewish News with us here on Talk TV. This feeds into that question we've been asking about free speech, whether it's under threat or not. I think this is interesting because Anna makes this point, uh, who texts in and says, everybody's missing the point with the Scottish bill. Uh, this is just the, the, the hate crime bill, as it's being dubbed that it came into force uh, tail end of last week. Um, hate speech was already illegal in the country, as it is in most Western countries. Nothing has really changed. Well, I don't think it was ever hate speech. Um, incitement, racism, homophobia, all of those areas, are that there is legislation rightly in place to tackle all of that stuff. But what, ap what appears to have happened here, and certainly this is my interpretation of it, um, is that we were left with some grey areas. There were grey areas where people thought, well, hang on a second, can I... Let's take the word non-binary as an obvious example, a completely invented phrase. Doesn't mean it's not even recognised by gender experts. As a, It's not a gender as such. It's someone's chosen disposition because they don't feel particularly female or male. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that's not what you're feeling, then fine. I mean, the idea that that becomes a recognised minority group is just anti-intellectual nonsense. I mean, it's utterly bonkers. And yet, for goodness knows how long now, uh, we have companies, you know, you, you talk about their, their non-binary staff. We have uh, news reports about a certain actor has come out as non-binary. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, it doesn't mean a, a, a thing. Like, say, an actor's come out because they've got a new hairstyle. It's fine if somebody wants to identify or feel whatever way they can. So it's areas such as that. Now, if I were to say any of that in Scotland... I could find myself getting nicked under hate crime legislation for reasons that nobody can quite fathom. So I understand what Anna says in that text, that, yes, the big stuff 
is rightly already illegal. But it's the grey area that Scotland appear to be trying to legislate against. And that's when, in the Venn diagram, you just start to sneak into that. Hang on a second, you're encroaching on my rights to have a, a freedom of expression here. If somebody feels hurt by it, what, are we legislating for that? This is like legislating for offence. You can't really do it. Let's take a call from Amanda, who's in East Sussex. On this very point, Amanda, what are you thinking? Good afternoon to you. Oh, hi, Ian. Oh, my goodness, this is so important. Um, we, we really have got to win this fight when it comes to our freedom of speech in this country because everything that's going on from the new hate crime bill in Scotland to the insanity with changing the colours of our flag, every which way they can get away with, everything that is going on, it's all about trying to radically change the United Kingdom as a whole and the way I see it is it's a form of Marxism that is taking over everywhere through the institutions, through this hate crime bill. It's about taking away our freedoms and our liberties that we've enjoyed in this democracy for hundreds of years now. It is so pernicious. And yep. just going on the hate crime bill, for instance, there is just no way in the world that you could ever legislate to um, criminalise or to control people's own thoughts in their own hearts and heads okay uh, there's just no there's no possible way in the world doesn't matter what they threaten you with but the the, the really frightening thing about this bill is the reason I think they've done it is because they want to frighten people to such an extent that they are actually fearful in their own homes now as well mm. to even allow themselves to express what they are truly feeling or what they perceive is is right you know so in other words if you know it's right that a man is a man and a woman is a woman there's not really anything in between but all of a sudden now people are going to be sitting in their homes in scotland frightened to state biological fact and that is just not right that's fascism to but do what that it's to what it's done though amanda is um a, a monumental disservice to the trans community who have lived quite yeah. peacefully um, yeah. without really exactly. too much controversy for many years. And it's only this sort of multifarious gender spectrum that somebody's introduced. You know, there are 120 genders. Spoiler alert, there aren't. There might be 120 words that some people like to describe them as to highlight and showcase or describe their own gender, sometimes sexual proclivities, um, sometimes yeah. their idea of what an identity is. That's not a gender. They're not genders, for goodness sake. That doesn't work like that. There's no science that would ever back that up. If you did a chromosome test on any of these people, we know it would either come back as that or that. And we've worked for years, I think most people, to, to try and live in a civilised, decent world where we respect each other. You know, racism back in the 70s was a whole different ballgame. Sexism, homophobia, all of these areas that I like to think in a civilised world we began to get under some level of control. You're never going to eradicate it all. No, no more than you're ever going to eradicate shoplifting, armed robbery or any other form of criminality. But you do your best and we've made amazing progress. And then another group of essentially cultural left-wing Marxists, whatever you want to call them, have come along and said, no, actually, no, 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 no. Actually, we deserve to be recognised. There are repression points in calling myself this or calling myself that. I mean, when a double rapist suddenly halfway through a trial says, I'm a woman, I need to be sent to a woman's jail, I think we should call that out every day of the week, right? Is there anybody with a straight face that would think that, oh, no, this is genuinely a woman who has the same rights and earned backstory as any other woman? Exactly. I mean, this is the level of insanity we've reached. And, and it's peak Orwellian. We have got to the stage of... George Orwell's 1984 is coming to fruition. It's actually arrived. It's there in Scotland. And if we're not careful, this is going to be copied and pasted when Labour get into power in this country. And it's well, very, very frightening. Do you know what? It's I mean, interesting. Amanda, thank you for your call. Just a very final point, though, on this. It's, I always think this is fascinating with politics, how if you don't like the cut of someone's jib politically, if they're on the right, for example, uh, they become, in terminology parlance, uh, an extreme right-winger or a hard right politician. But we never afford the same to the left. And you know what? This country is crammed full of sizzling Marxists lurking 
uh, on the back benches of the Labour Party in the Scottish National Party, people who are extremists, as extreme as some of those on the right, which we rightly call out if they go so far over there, they become something else. But we don't tend to do the same on the left. Don't underestimate how many... You, you used Amanda used the phrase Marxist there. Um, don't underestimate how many of those people would use that as a badge of honour. That's why this legislation is here, because there's enough like-minded politicians who actually believe in this garbage. They really believe in this stuff. We're going to take a short pause. Coming up after the break, a new TikTok scam targeting expectant mums who are willing to help migrants bypass the UK asylum system. We'll look at that next. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and, of course, your smart speaker. Now, Albanian asylum seekers who have been refused British citizenship are targeting single pregnant mothers in a gang-led TikTok scam to become legally registered as their newborn's dad. Their hope is that being a member of a British family will allow them to evade deportation. Joining me now is immigration lawyer Ivan Sampson. Always good to gauge your views on these things, Ivan. What the heck is going on here? Well, the, the registration of um, parents at the moment for unmarried couples is decided either by the couple signing the registration document together simultaneously, or one of them signing the declaration, the other one taking the declaration later to get them signed. So there's no requirement to prove who is the the birth father, uh, the biological father of um, 
of a child. Um, that could be looked at. But being on the birth certificate gives a migrant parental responsibility. Yeah. And with that comes um, an advantage, immigration advantage, because they can then make applications on the basis of their relationship with a British child. Um, so there's various applications they can make. Uh, one of them is what's called EX1 leave on the grounds that uh, the, the article of the family rights uh, of a family looked at in total, including that rights of a child. And it would be disproportionate to separate a British child from a father. I, I would imagine that, that it's almost a done deal once you're on that certificate, that you know it's unlikely you're going to get deported, right? Unless somebody can prove malfeasance in, in how you got there. But how does this come around? Because maybe I'm being naive here, but how do you find en masse uh, a number of single uh, expectant or recently um, re re new mothers, as it were, recent young women who've become mothers. I mean, there's no specific database, is there? Or is that just a lot of uh, searching through social media? Yes, I think, I think that's exactly what it is. And, and, and there will be desperate people are willing to pay great sums of money to remain here. But you say it's a dumb thing. It's not quite so simple. The Home Office can ask the father to provide DNA evidence where they suspect that the relationship is not genuine. Invariably, they're going to get interviewed for any application, more than likely. If somebody's an asylum seeker and all of a sudden, after their refusal, they say, well, I've got uh, I've got uh, my partner, unmarried partner, so about to expect to have a child, I think the Home Office will be entitled to have DNA evidence. The problem is it's voluntary. Um, we could change that footing and make it compulsory. But at the moment, the Home Office guidance, which was published back in uh, March 2020, um, it only asked for voluntary DNA testing for biological fathers, which, I, which, is a, which is absurd, really. If someone claims to be the father of a child after having a refusal, mm. then I think um, it should be mandatory. Yeah, you'd have thought so. And, and Ivan, do we have any intel on how much money is exchanged here for, for this deal? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know one. When I was a young lawyer, um, somebody approached me and offered me sums of money and I reported them. And I was looking for... I thought it was, it was one of your undercover journalists, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, but I was... Uh, I was absolutely categorically refused it. But at that time, going, this is going back a couple of decades, Ian, I was offered £5,000. I did report it. Wow. Um, and... Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know what the figure is, but it would be several thousand pounds, I'd I imagine. Thought, yeah, I would have thought so. You're still a young lawyer, by the way, Ivan. Let's just clear that up. Uh, nothing nothing wrong with stating the, uh, the, the facts of the piece here. Um, in terms of who's behind this, I mean, we hear about this being kind of organised crime, not just one or two people trying it on, but, you know, a cartel of, of chiefs who've got together to try and, you know, find a, uh, a, a solution to their, their migration issues. But this is on a grand scale, we hear. It could be. I don't know what the data is. But the worrying thing, Ian, is this. The government has policies to stop this happening. The government can enforce, can well, voluntarily request DNA evidence. But if it's not forthcoming, you would then reject any EX1 application on the basis of credibility. But this is always a problem with the government. The law is there to catch these people. It's just not being enforced and utilised. Mm. Um, so it's organisation, it's uh, having sufficiently well-trained people uh, robustly um, catching these people, and, that, and that's the problem. Um, there's enough law out there that we always hear about, we need new laws. No, I don't think we do need new laws. So it, it exists. Uh, the law's sufficiently yeah. strong to catch these people and remove them. OK, it exists already. Just before you go, Ivan, a, a word, if, uh, if you would, on those latest numbers of people crossing the channel. 5,400, that's a new record. 800 people this weekend. I mean, that's a huge amount of people. When you think of 800 people all coming in boats, that's a lot of people, mm. it's a lot of boats. Uh, that Rwanda deterrence going brilliantly, it seems. Uh, um, I mean, clearly, there is a, there's, there's a huge issue for Rishi Sunak here. What's your response to those latest numbers? Two words. The policy is it's unlawful. Everyone knows it. The government lawyers know it. Um, all the human rights organisations know it. The laws and lords know it. The MPs know it's unlawful. And finally, the, the, UN, the UN have said 
it's unlawful. It breaches our treaty obligation under the Refugee Convention, the principle of non fulfillment It breaches our obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights. It also breaches Article 8, having a fair, fair, fair hearing, because it, it limits the right to appeal. Um, unless, of course, a minister, um, uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, the minister can veto any right to uh, interim challenge by way of an injunction stopping removal. So it clearly is unlawful. Everyone knows it. So the government should really look to strategies. So what, that yeah, whether you, whether you want to support it or not is irrelevant. The actual structure of how it's been created is, it, it is not it, legally sound is is your point and of course it what's is, also and, not and legally the, the sound but, but it's not legally sound for five and a half thousand people to just jump on a boat is it no no, no. It, the point is this is where you need to understand the refugee convention you don't have to legally enter the uk to claim asylum that's the law yeah now if you don't like it change the convention change, change the convention listen ivan you don't like i step in but there for no other reason than time it's not always... illegal to come across the channel that's the law that is the law whether people like it or not thank you very much indeed ivan sampson immigration lawyer with us here on talk tv let's get a word back on our original subject on free speech is it under threat in this country alan is in aberdeen what are you thinking al good afternoon to you hi ian um my god Set the clock back 1,400 years for free speech in Scotland. Well, I'll tell you what. How about we bring the mosques in, for, in Scotland forward 1,400 years? How about they have some, um, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of these uh, trans storytelling hours in the mosques, some gay pride flags? How about women being allowed to pray in the mosques next to the men? But I'll tell you what. In Scotland here, this is not only about trying to silence um, women, and it's not only about the trans rights, which we all respect, but let's be honest, a man in a dress is never going to be a female biological female. That is a fact. But this is also about a blasphemy law. So you can sit and criticise um, Christianity and, you know, look at what's going on against Israel. We've got anti-Semitic Hamas ISIS rapist apologists on our streets marching. You can do that, but you can't say that a man in a dress is a man. It is, it is so upside down. Alan, yep. you are right. You get the final word on this. Thank you for that. We are in a sort of Alice in Wonderland type topsy-turvy existence at the moment. It's utterly chaos out there. We've come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Back again, same time, 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Up next, Daisy McAndrew is in for Vanessa Feltz. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the 